And so most of the big money in this country, which is run by financial advisories that have no interest in, in relinquishing any of those funds to gold and silver, um, that doesn't surprise me at all. And, you know, the rest of the world sees things differently, and they're the ones that are, are accumulating all of the gold and silver. Welcome back to Soar Financially. Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us again in the new year. Welcome to 2024. It's going to be a wild one based on the comments I've had here on this channel. 2023 was just the prelude to what is about to happen in 2024. And uh, we'll see, of course. Uh, we've got some excellent guests lined up this week to discuss again some of the trends we're seeing at going into the year. And uh, yeah, it's going to be crazy. Trust me. Uh, we're going to look at some charts. We're going to look at some uh, technicals. We're going to look at some business cycles with our guests this week. And we're, of course, we're going to look at some bullion trends. Starting off the week and starting off the new year, couldn't imagine a better guest than Andy Schechtman. He's the founder, president, uh, uh, just a head honcho over at Miles Franklin. And uh, looking forward to discussing with him some trends he sees as well on the bullion side. Because I heard in uh, back in early November from other uh, bullion traders that some of the investors or not investors but owners of gold and silver are selling small amounts to cover daily living expenses so i'm curious i'm going to feel uh, you know check back in with uh, with andy here and see what what he sees as well on a daily basis so but before i switch over to my guest there's a subscribe button here somewhere i might be over here now but uh hit that we truly appreciate it leave a comment leave a like we do want to hear from you and uh, help us spread the video and spread the message educate investors to see what is going on now Andy, happy new year, my friend. It's great to welcome you back. Good to see you. Always good to be back with you, brother Kai. I appreciate it very much. Look forward to seeing you in person in a few weeks up in Vancouver, but uh, happy new year to you and your family and everyone out there. And um, thanks for uh, dragging me back in the fold. Absolutely. Yeah, no, J uh, January 2nd. I, I was off for almost two weeks here and uh, did a couple of interviews between Christmas and New Year's, but uh, it was tough to be focused, to be honest. Like Christmas at home with a family, now getting back to it, right? But uh, easy. With you Don't as a first guest, it. you know, you make it Don't easy. I know so. it, brother. <laughs> it is. It's hard to... It's it's hard to... Uh, it's really nice to step away. Everyone needs that a little bit. One of the things that I find interesting is that when you do come back after a week or two of letting your brain, you know, unravel and decompress, how much you've missed. And, you know, it, it's when I was young, Kai, I mean, I've been doing this uh, next month will be 34 years that, that I've been doing this. And when I was young, it was like um, kind of like a roll of toilet paper, a brand new, fresh one, barely spun. You never noticed the passage of time. You didn't see things happening, you know, and and um, as time uh, passes, maybe one or two or three events a year that were truly noteworthy. And it just seems that now it's like the roll is spinning and you can see the cardboard coming. What does the cardboard have in store for us? when the role goes empty. But what I mean really about all of this is that it's just things are just spinning so much faster than they ever did. And every single day there's something noteworthy and that in and of itself would have dominated the mainstream news years ago. And now it's just become fabric of, of, of daily life. The craziness, the, the, the craziness we see around the country and around the world, the lawlessness, the open borders, the, the divisiveness, all of these things that are just bombarding us. So it was nice to unwind and focus on family and friends and a little bit of NFL football and even a couple cocktails. But, um, you know, here we are, 2024. I believe it's going to be the craziest year of my career. I have this feeling that I can, maybe I could articulate it if I really thought about it, but I almost feel like I can't. Like, it's just this feeling that I think a lot of people have of things just you know for all you uh kids who grew up in the 70s uh the original star wars you know there there's a disturbance in the force and i feel it i just don't know exactly what it is but happy to run shotgun with you here and talk about it and let's let's all start let's to unpack it. things let's do it absolutely Let, let's start with uh, recapping 2023 a little bit andy i called it a bit of a prelude to what is about to happen this year um let, let, let's start with that what were some of the most important you know trends you've seen last year or trends events that sort of impacted what you, what you're looking at uh that might path the way for a tumultuous 2024 here 
Well, you know, I, I've, my main focus for the last three, four years has been on this growing coalition of countries, the BRICS, um, that are gaining legitimacy, gaining credibility, um, gaining critical mass, um, gaining mass adoption. And in 2023, we saw the admittance, which just went full uh, effect here yesterday, of uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Ethiopia uh, and Egypt. And, you know, th this 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 is a big deal as far as I'm concerned. This is a very, very big deal. I think the end of the U.S. hegemony is over the entire world is becoming obvious. I think that's kind of one of the main trends that I saw in, in 2023. And, you know, I think I would cap it off by saying maybe the biggest the biggest event that I saw in 2023 that that really puts an exclamation point on the BRICS and you know we can talk about the fact that there's another 16 countries that have already formally applied another 20 plus countries uh, that have expressed interest you're talking 40 countries in all and if not more a massive growing coalition. But, you know, I've talked a lot about Saudi Arabia. I focused on Saudi Arabia for several years now. I think that's kind of what's got me noticed in this industry because I was talking about this stuff before everyone was in 2019, 2020, and all the almost 1,400 YouTube videos I've done, every one of them talks about the BRICS going back that far. And I've often talked about Saudi Arabia as being the linchpin of all of this. And I, I would say, look, you know, they 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 joined the Belt Road Initiative along with every other OPEC country in the world. That's 75 percent of human population right now, 50 percent of global GDP right now, uh, a growing, growing group uh, of countries that are, are uniting together. The West isn't part of it. I talked about how they applied for and have been admitted to uh, formally uh, into the BRICS. Huge deal, right? That Yeah, big deal. I talked about how they joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. This is another big deal that isn't talked about enough, which I think people need to focus on the fact that the SCO is the largest regional financial and military organization on the planet. You know, you can't make these provocative moves against the West. Um, you know, uh, Gaddafi and, and um, Saddam Hussein showed that to be true. Um, unless you got your, your six covered, your rear end. And I think it's easy to say that when Saudi Arabia uh, applied to these groups, you know, the, the realization that they're being protected, perhaps, by two of the three largest nuclear arsenals on the planet is certainly something to think about. I talked about how they joined the BRICS New Development Bank. This is all, a lot of this in 2023 happened. Not all of it, but a lot. And that was a big deal, obviously, because this is like the World Bank. It is the engine of finance and growth for this new regime. And, and I want people to understand that, you know, this is something that I see coming. It's not something that's going to happen immediately until it does. It's the logarithmic decay theory. Little by little by little by little by little and bang, all at once. When is the all at once? I don't know. Brent Johnson and his milkshake theory is very astute. He's been right, and he will be right until he's not. And I, I've been, I don't want to say wrong. I think I have been right, and I'm phrasing it the right way, that ultimately and inevitably these things are going to happen. And I'm getting somewhere with this guy. I'm sorry I'm dragging it out, but I want to lay the foundation. And look, I think I will be right. I think I have been right. I'm not expecting tomorrow to be the end of the U.S. dollar. But there will come a time when the 500-year um, dominance of the West and the hegemony and the, the sanctions and the coercion and the bullying and doing things in a, not in a cooperative manner will have run its course. The mismanagement of the world reserve currency will have run its course. All of these things in time will have run its course. So this is one of the things that I focus on, this little by little by little by little, then bang all at once, this logarithmic decay. So all of these things that have led up to this point have been really, really, in my opinion, very important. Now, we see Saudi Arabia in Davos in 2023 tell the folks at the World Bank meeting that, yeah, we're, we're interested in listening to other currencies talk about paying, other countries talk about paying for oil and other currencies. Remember, it is the backing 
of 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 the petrodollar, the 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 fact that Saudi Arabia and OPEC have valued oil in dollars for 50 years, that has given the dollar its petrodollar status, the given us the world reserve status. And there was a comment made in 2023 that was incredibly provocative, not the most provocative thing, which is coming. I'll talk about in a second. But look, China, uh, Saudi Arabia said, look, China is our most important uh, partner in oil sales this year and for the next 50. Well, that's a big statement, right? It's been 50 years that we've been protecting the Saudi kingdom and had this privilege. And I think when you talk about the meaning of words and the significance of them, there's a lot to to, to unpack in that statement alone. And I don't think it, the... I think it, it, there there was symbolism in what he was saying. It, it, there's no joke in what he was saying, and it's foretelling the future of the dollar and and its relationship to oil sales globally. But to me, the biggest event happened just a few weeks ago, and it's interesting. You can't really find it. MSN came out with an article and talked about it. Uh, you can find it if you look hard enough. But here's the deal. So. Saudi Arabia doing all of these things has been my main focus, right? And and certainly, I think ultimately there will come a day when Saudi Arabia and the rest of OPEC say to the West, listen, you guys have signed an executive order to go green. We respect that. We appreciate all you've done for us. But we're now joining with a, a, a growing coalition of countries that represents the majority of humanity who doesn't have aspirations of going green. And so we're going to hitch our wagon in a different manner. But thanks for the memories. And that's when it becomes a religious experience in this country as the world dumps dollars because they don't need to stockpile them. This synthetic demand that has been created for 50 years to buy oil is no longer necessary. And the byproduct of that massive uh, overwhelming of dollars hitting our shores is massively spiked interest rates. And all of the inverse correlation to the asset prices in this country becomes a very, very, very big problem very quickly, not to mention the banks which cannot handle interest rates spiking to that magnitude, it's the great reset, right? You we, you and I were talking offline and you know, a lot of people are saying this is the year of the great reset. Well, whenever that happens, there's your great reset and there's your villain to point to, Xi Jinping and Putin and OPEC, they did it to us, right? But that's, that's neither here nor there. To me, the big one was this story that came out just a couple of weeks ago. United Arab Emirates hosted a, um, a summit in Dubai um, 200 countries for, uh, for the United Nations uh, on climate change. Interestingly enough, it was presided over by the chief of the uh, state-owned United Arab Emirates Oil Company, who told the ex-president of uh, Ireland, you know, just so you know, if we go this way, if we go completely green away from fossil fuels, you'll send civilization back to the caves. So you can understand where they're coming from. Now, look, they are the seventh largest producer of oil in the world. Uh, United Arab Emirates. They were just admitted and formally uh, accepted into the BRICS alongside of Saudi Arabia. They are a OPEC producing country. Two days, two days before 200 countries from around the world come to Dubai for this summit, United Arab Emirates announces we do not want to take dollars for oil anymore. Now that is a very, very, very big shot to cross the bow. Uh, of the Western hegemony. And what's even more interesting to me is that the soon as the summit ends, and I think the timing of this is no coincidence, you make this announcement right before 200 countries come to your to, to Dubai to talk about climate change. Um, and right when the summit ends, you get Putin, who hasn't left the country but twice because of, in the last two years because of the Western bounty on his head, decides to fly in an impromptu meeting to the United Arab Emirates flanked by four MiG fighter jets. What were they discussing? Do you think it had anything to do with uh, that statement, just like Gaddafi and, and Hussein you know, made that statement and then were quickly um, invaded and the regimes toppled? Do you think it had anything to do? I don't know, maybe it did, I'm not sure. And then he goes directly to Saudi Arabia where the day after he leaves, OPEC announces an increase to 2 million barrels of oil per day that will be decreased. So de uh, increasing the decrease uh, of 2 million barrels per day. What you are seeing are these countries forming alliances. Uh, they are so, um, they are taking the place of the, the Western alliances. So to me, 
Maybe the biggest development of 2023 was the United Arab Emirates making this announcement in a manner that that has been largely ignored by the West. So um, I guess this is just more of the same for me. And I, I would say one last thing, and I know I kind of put more into this question than you bargained for. I apologize. <laughs> but that is that the West does things in a manner whereby instant gratification is not fast enough. And that's why when the currency didn't happen in, in 2023, the, the common settlement currency for the BRICS, everyone said, ah, see, I don't, I don't view it that way. In, in cryptocurrency, they call it mass adoption. Look, uh, by, by next year in, in, um, in Russia, as Russia takes over the presidency uh, for the BRICS, as it rotates each year, you could have a potential of, of almost up to 40 countries in the new BRICS uh, uh, group. At right now, you know, we don't know exactly how many, but 16 have formally applied, if not 20, formally. And, you know, put that together, you're at, you know, 30, 40 countries, possibly, growing um, in legitimacy. Now, they were all tasked at going back to the, to the drawing boards and coming back and presenting their findings for a common settlement currency. It'll happen at some point. Why do you think gold was reclassified tier one? But I want people to understand that this is being done methodically and they're doing things in a very methodical fashion that when they do say, hey, folks, we're done, dollars done, thanks for the memories, that they have all of their bases covered. And I think 2024 will be just that, more and more reinforcing of a growing group of countries that represents the majority of humanity in terms of population, a larger military might by a long shot than the West, more GDP than the West. They're already there right now. The BRICS countries right now account for more GDP than the G7. And then you talk about oil and rare earths. They have more energy and commodities than the West does by a long shot. In fact, they're, they're going to control the majority of the oil production, the liquid natural gas, all the rare earth metals, the, the precious metals. And this is something that is happening more and more and more. And, and if you look at the countries that are joining, like Venezuela has just formally applied in and of themselves, what is Venezuela? Well, but they do have the largest known um, untapped oil reserves in the world. So you're dealing with countries in terms of shipping lanes and of their commodities and natural resources that are making the BRICS countries a very formidable foe. And little by little by little by little, then bang all at once, you have to see the big picture. And if you're too obsessed with instant gratification, you'll poo-poo this. But I will tell you that could be a very dangerous mistake at one point. And I don't know if it's 2024, 25, 26, I don't know. But they will flip the switch and you will see a move away from the dollar as the sole settlement currency for oil. So to me, that was by far the biggest event of 2023. And I think it will continue to be the biggest event in my mind um, until we see some sort of, of ultimate outcome where you have a real challenging uh, of the dollar. So don't mean to, to to answer that in such a roundabout way, but I think to me that there are only a very few things that are really important to me and the rest is the periphery is kind of noise, Kai. No, no, absolutely. And it makes a lot of sense. A lot of follow-up questions here to be asked as well. But uh, w w one topic I want to follow up on really is uh, geopolitics in the region right now uh, as well in the Middle East, because you mentioned Saudi Arabia and uh, they're, they're playing a pivotal role also uh, on the political side, not just on the economic side, you know, economic warfare and using, uh, you know, de-dollarizing massive swaps with uh, China there as well. But um, on the political front, they're getting involved. They're trying to negotiate between Israel and Hamas and uh, and even to the with the Houthis to degree to to a certain, certain influence and dominance there as well. Do you see that role growing? And will 2024 be the year where they say, okay, hey, here we are. And I think they've done that uh, last year as well, where they... Um, Sort of intervened in certain events and said, "Guys, you got to slow this down. We 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 got to be here, a more sensible." Where they just stepped up. Yeah, I, I mean, I I don't know. I think the whole, I think you could look at this group of countries and say they do things in a different manner. They do things in more of a cooperative manner, and you know, you look at at the relationships that, as an example, that China bridged between Saudi Arabia and Iran where they're building embassies in each other's countries, where you know they're letting bygones be bygones, the first ever railway built between Iran and Iraq. 
Um, and, you know, when you talk about what's going on in Yemen with the Houthis, I, I there's a part of me that that feels like this is playing right into the hands of of Putin, because what they have right now is something um, where, look, Putin has come out and said the Suez Canal cannot be considered effective anymore. And what they're trying to do is use the Russians North Sea route. It's uh, a corridor that. Um, it, it it runs perfect synergy with the Belt Road Initiative and it, it allows safe passage in a much, much faster way, uh, either by Russian rail or by this Northern Sea route. And, um, you know, it, it, it takes 10 days less to use that than to go around the Suez Canal in the Red Sea, which is now, you know, now a very dangerous place to be. But um, in terms of geopolitical events, yeah, I think that I think you're going to see um, more than anything sides be being chosen, and and the way that these countries are doing it is in a cooperative fashion rather than in a coercive fashion. So I think China will lead the way with this, to be honest with you, and I think Saudi Arabia will um, do what they need to do uh, to survive, and I think that means by choosing sides and. I think they will become less and less and less accommodative to the West um, and to the West's uh, desires. The fact that they are now a full-fledged member of the BRICS tells me where their alliance uh, and their allegiance lies. So um, part of me feels like the West is big, is going to be going at this. in, a, in a, I don't want to say alone because there still are countries that are backing the West in, in doing these things, but uh, much less... Um, much less cooperation, if you will, from countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, because, you know, I think there is no coincidence that when you see them striking deals with all of these countries uh, and, and the West isn't part of it, the United States aren't part of it, their geopolitical decisions are, gonna, are going to benefit them more than they will benefit us. And again, these are things that have to be done methodically. And so little by little by little, we will see these types of uh, these types of very big decisions on which side of the table do you lie upon or 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 which side are you falling on in terms of, uh, you know, are you are you going to be with the West or are you going to be with the BRICS? And I just think that you're going to see more and more and more uh, of a push to strengthen the alliance that they are now part of and, and much less reliance on helping the West achieve what they want. In essence, if you get this North Sea corridor working and 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 these new passages, you know, like the Northwest Corridor, I think it's called, which is is passage between Iran and, and Russia all the way through uh, and, and India, you know, the reliance upon or or the importance of the U.S. Navy patrolling these these waters becomes less and less and less. And now you have the new BRICS Naval Alliance patrolling the Indian Ocean. These countries are joining together to benefit them, and they're pushing back against the Western dominance, against the Western uber capitalism, where you know they figure they feel that we've pillaged all the world's commodities forever, and and it's about time for them to to be more. Uh, reliant upon themselves rather than upon the West. So um, more of the same. And I think you'll expect to see more of that in 2024. One topic they couldn't agree on last year, last year's meeting was a gold backed currency for, for everybody. But uh, as you said, like it, it seems like a little by little by little, maybe that was a bit uh, too, too much too quickly. And yep. uh, maybe again, Western mentality, we want everything at once, of course. So not thinking this through properly, because I think it was against the wishes of China and India to potentially introduce a gold-backed currency at this point in time. Do, do you see that discussion off the table or what, what are your no. thoughts on that just to follow up? No, I think it, it's it's ultimately 100% going to happen. I, I mean, look, there's no reason for the BIS to reclassify gold the only other tier one reserve asset in the world and when you look at the amount of gold that's been accumulated and silver by by the central banks you know you're talking over the last two years more gold accumulated by the central banks and mostly those central banks than at any time ever in central banking history um i just think that in order to issue a currency that has legitimacy you have to like in crypto speak you have to have mass adoption they weren't ready to do it and, and, you know, Jim Rickards is a very smart man and, and he's more tied in than I'll ever be. 
I think, you know, what he said will ultimately be, he said two things that, that made a lot of sense to me. One, they'll issue a gold backed currency. I couldn't agree more. I think there will be a marriage of gold and blockchain technology where you will have a, a blockchain that shows what every country has, has pledged to the new system. It'll be a, um, uh, uh, it won't be a reserve currency at first, maybe, but it will be a settlement currency and it will be pegged to, to commodities. We've been told that by the Russian finance minister for years. I believe it to be true. The BIS reclassified gold. All the banks are repatriating their gold and massively accumulating it. And you look at the amount of gold that China and, and, and Russia and India and Saudi Arabia, all of these countries have been accumulating. It's off the charts and, and they're not even telling us how much they're really accumulating but you have to do it in a manner that has mass adoption you can't do something like this unless all of the i's are dotted and t's are crossed if you look at what happened at the end of the meeting kai they said the meeting in johannesburg let's all go back to the drawing board come back and present your findings next year on a common settlement currency in the meantime let's all trade in local currencies and that's exactly what you see happening the deals are being struck and, you know, China has some 30 currency swaps with other countries, 30 countries worth of currency swaps where they agree to, to use each other's currencies in lieu of the U.S. dollar for settlement. And each one of these currency swaps or all of these settlements that are being, being done outside the dollar is another swing at the tree. Chop, 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 or little by little by little by little. And ultimately, it will affect the reserve status of the US dollar. And that's that's really the, the issue here is that yes, all of the dollar bulls are correct. It still is the most liquid market on the planet. And, and it still is the world reserve currency, but you can see that little by little changes are being made. Now, yes, if they were to issue a gold backed currency, which I believe ultimately they will and tie it to cryptocurrency to a blockchain, which I believe ultimately they will. And the reason they'll do that is because President de Gaulle from France proved that convertible currencies convert. He, he, you know, he he drained, started draining all the gold held at the Treasury, and that's why Nixon closed the gold window. So if you make a currency, you know, Gresham's Law, where you know good money chases out bad, um, you you're going to have a deal where people will convert. But if you instead don't allow the conversion, but have immutability and veracity and transparency. You have uh, the the gold or whatever commodity is pegged to the system on the the ledger and have it audited and be completely transparent about it. You have legitimacy immediately, and I think that's ultimately where we are going. Even Kristalina Georgieva, the head of the IMF, said any uh, central bank digital currency that is not pegged to something is just another fiat currency. I think they know they have to tie it to something and. What better to do than the only other tier one reserve asset? And do you think there's any coincidence that the central bankers of the world have bought more than at any time in history? Of course not. But they're doing it the right way. Now, my only question is, do, does the West beat them to it? Because I think the West realizes this has to happen too. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting where the IMF not only made that statement, but when I saw you back in Vancouver, like right around, this was about a year ago, they came out with a report titled Gold uh, International Reserve Currency, comma, a barbarous relic no more. So even the IMF and the Western central banks understand that, you know, we've probably squeezed as much credibility out of the fiat system as we ever will. The next system, like Zoltan Pozar says, one based on commodities and transparency will have to be pegged to something. So ultimately, we will see a gold back currency. There's just too much coincidence there to not. Um, but here again, West thinks in terms of immediate and it's not quick enough. And that's why Rickards got crap. And that's why people say it's a nothing burger because they can't see past the reality of it is that, you know, they probably made this the, the decision. This is not the time to do it. It will fail. We need to get more countries on board. We need to have a larger swath of, of, of humanity that is part of this ecosystem before we challenge the dollar's dominance. And so until then, we'll trade in local currencies, go back to the drawing board, tell me what you find, and keep buying gold. And that's what they basically they said. And look at who's buying it all. They are. 
And so, yeah, I do think ultimately it's coming little by little by little. Then bang, you'll wake up one morning and there'll be a new BRICS currency. And Saudi Arabia and OPEC says, hey, guys, listen, you're going green. Thanks for the memories. We're now going to take the new BRICS settlement currency for oil. Um, and we're not taking dollars anymore. I mean, UAE just made that announcement. How hard would it be to see that? When that happens, things become really, really chaotic, really, really fast as interest rates spike to the moon to combat that massive influx of inflation as the world dumps dollars. Every country in the world's had to own them for 50 years to buy oil. That synthetic demand is a privilege that I don't think people realize how exorbitant of a privilege it is and why we should be doing everything to cling to it, it seems, on all fronts, both domestically and internationally, we're doing all we can to show we don't deserve the, the reserve status anymore. And as I probably mentioned the last time we talked, the ironic thing about all of this, Kai, is the lead economic advisor to the U.S. government, Jared Bernstein, his whole platform is to lose the reserve status because it is an exorbitant privilege we can no longer afford because of the trade imbalances and distortions it creates. Well, you couldn't do an any, a better job of losing the reserve status than by weaponizing the dollar Talk of confiscating those assets, not just sanctioning them, but confiscating them, using them to rebuild the Ukraine. That's a whole different ball of wax in the world community. And then telling Saudi Arabia, the linchpin of the hegemony, hey, we're going green and sign an executive order to do it. I mean, you couldn't do a better job. Is all of this coincidental or is it too stupid to be stupid? And that's, you know, the point is, is this by design? Why would they do it? Because it's a lot easier to blow up the system that you've mismanaged and screwed up completely and totally, indebted to 150 trillion in debt, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, government, military pensions that are not on uh, uh, added to the 34 trillion dollar debt, 150 or so trillion in in funded and unfunded liabilities with five trillion in assets. The largest being student debt. 40 percent of our assets are student debt. We are broke. We're insolvent. We're at 130% debt to GDP, and there's never been a country that crossed that line that didn't default ever, either outright default or by hyperinflation. So if they do this because we incentivized them to, and the public doesn't get that part, there's no way they incentivized them. Yeah, we did. Now you have a villain to point to that blew up the whole system. Those bastards did it to us. And, and a rallying cry to bring in the new CBDC when the dollar gets pummeled and dumped by every country on the planet the byproduct of which means interest rates go parabolic and everything that people feel wealthy about in this country poof, is gone. And and the banks and our money, but have no fear because Lael Brainerd, number two at the White House, a modern monetary theorist who d helped develop the CBDC that Biden signed in, into executive order with MIT. She also just ushered in um, FedNow, which is the Vel Venmo or Zelle on steroids backed by the Fed. That came out a couple months ago. That will replace checks and wires in no time. She, This is what she wants. So is all of this by design? Is it, is it coincidental? I don't know. But the one thing I would say is that I admire the way that the BRICS countries are going about their business. They're doing it the right way. And if you are going to take such a provocative step as to challenge what is five century old Western dominance, you better do it the right way. And that's exactly what they're doing. And, and I think that's what we will see in 2024. Absolutely. And Andy, we, when we t last talked, I think I might have asked you or mentioned that uh, it seems like there was a directive sent out to G7 countries plus friends not to buy any bullion, right? Uh, the, not for the central banks to buy any bullion. Now, c humor me, you, humor me in the audience here. What would happen if the US were to buy one ton of gold? tomorrow what, what what were to happen what was what would be the signal what would that mean you know i mean one ton isn't even that much anymore oh. but i think i, I think that i think they, it's a symbolic character it could have been an ounce it doesn't matter yeah i mean if they announce that we're starting to buy a whole bunch of gold again it's almost weird that they don't but you have to ask yourself where did Gaddafi's gold go where did saddam hussein's gold? how about the 12 billion in gold the ukraine sold to fund the war, where did that go? You have to wonder, are we getting our gold in, in less than um, transparent manner? Uh, but I, I think it would signal um, to to the world it, it's pretty much um, you know every man for himself sort of thing, sort of thing. And and the reason the West haven't been accumulating gold is because gold is the antithesis of the system, and it 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 it, it shows the inherent weakness and fragility 
of the Western system. And that's why they've suppressed it forever. And it wasn't just, you know, the, the U.S. Central Bank. You had the Swiss National Bank and, and the, you know, the, the uh, Gordon Brown uh, of, of the U.K. who sold the majority of, of uh, England's gold at 250 bucks an ounce. You have all of the Western banks, Portugal, France, all of them were involved in this to make the Western system and the bond market seem stronger than they were when you maintain an environment of suppressed interest rates. And that's really what they have done to create a perception and illusion of wealth and, and prosperity by suppressing interest rates. You make your home and your 401k and all of these things that, that make you feel wealthy, you give them uh, much higher value. You, and uh, I think when you realize that the term Gibson's paradox is the inverse relationship between real interest rates and the price of gold, if you're gonna suppress interest rates to maintain this illusion, uh, you have to kill the canary. And that's that's gold and silver, and and this is a game where now the west, the 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 east is, is beating the west using the suppression against us. And in other words, what the west didn't count on is that back when they started doing this, a lot of these countries in and of themselves didn't have the ability to stand up to the west. But now you're finding safety in numbers, and all of these countries are standing for delivery. And they're just accumulating as much as they can. And now you're beginning to see something happen that I think is very interesting. And that is you have China slowly turning up the heat. You know, you got silver priced two bucks an ounce higher in, in Shanghai than you do it off the London Metals Exchange or the Comex. You have gold throughout 2023 was as high as 150 bucks an ounce higher, anywhere from 80 to 150 higher, slowly arbitraging all the metal over. They do things methodically, slowly. And and that's really, I think, the trademark here. We're playing checkers, they're playing chess. And if the West were to make that statement, I think things would accelerate very, very, very quickly because, you know, I think it signals that this is a losing game. You can only suppress or manipulate a market for an extended period of time by pushing in the direction it's going. And we are losing this battle as people are, are gobbling up all that they can. And, and that's why... The price hasn't taken off to the degree that I think a lot of people would think. You got the West trying to hold it down to to maintain uh, supremacy, and you got the rest of the world not bitching that it's being manipulated because they're accumulating it slowly enough to not push it through the roof. But when you see the emergence of the Shanghai Gold Exchange and, and the Metals Exchange in Dubai and the Moscow Exchange... There will come a time when the West and their ridiculous rehypothecated system, where right now the, the silver market on Colmex, the registered category, is 1,500% rehypothecated, meaning there are 1,500 times uh, the paper contracts, 1,500% times the paper contracts as there are bars in the vault. In other words, 14 people get cash settled, one person gets the bars in theory. Well, it would be it would be force majeure long before that. But the point of it is, is that they're able to issue 15 times as many contracts in silver as there are bars behind it. That's what the Hunt brothers noticed. And it is an illusion where the, the paper markets control the commodity price. It should be the other way around. It's the tail wagging the dog where the speculators can push the price of oil to negative $40 a barrel. How the hell do you do that? by the leverage you get in these contracts and the rest of the world sees the Western exchanges for what they are, a scam. But if you're going to pickpocket the world, then you use the leverage of the Western suppression against us. And that's what they're doing. Slowly, don't wake everybody up and let the price skyrocket in a world where information travels like that. No, keep volatility in it. Uh, so and make it counterintuitive. Like, why hasn't gold taken off the way that most people think it should? And I think it should be a, a whole hell of a lot higher, even in the face of headwinds of real interest rates that have gone up, you know, uh, 500 basis points in the last year. It doesn't matter. It's that this is being done in, in a very methodical fashion. And if the West were to signal we lose, we give up. Um, kind of like the end of the London gold pool. Well, yeah, you'd see the price go parabolic very quickly. No, no definitely. L lots of good points. And you half answered my next question there, Andy, already. Because we entered the year, the record high gold price. We're trading around 2070 as we're speaking here, uh, dollars per ounce. 
a lot, lot of commentators, a lot of analysts expected a follow through and a price rally in gold once we broke that all time high around 2080, I think it was. Uh, we haven't seen it. We quickly jumped to 2135, I believe, but then quickly dropped down again as well. But why didn't why don't we see that follow through? Is it really just uh, like to, to paraphrase a little bit, just just market manipulation there, just keeping the price in check to keep things in order? I think that's part of it. I mean, you had a lot of people who who you know bought um, in 2011 and have been waiting a long time to get out. I mean, sure, that's some of it. I don't believe any of that. Why do I even say that? I mean, sure, okay. That's, I'll tell you that, that, um, to me, it, 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 it's when you look at the way the market moves, when you look at the way that it gets clubbed at the AM fix and the PM fix, when you look at the way that it gets clubbed heading into New York, markets don't behave that way. There is a very strong vested interest by the West and the Western banks to suppress the price of gold and silver. Look, I mean, just on a very basic level, you know, gold and silver signal frailty of the system. So all of the the assets or investments that a lot of these commercial banks have, you know, they don't want to see gold and silver take off because it it signals that, hey, maybe there's a problem in the equity markets or in, in the markets that they're heavily involved in. And look, um, I think more than anything, the illusion of dollar supremacy is one that is, has been maintained by low interest rates and 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 a low gold and silver price. They're not commodities. They are a barometer of the health of the system. So as much as I want to believe that there are market dynamics like people just trying to finally get out after being underwater for so long, sure, that's a part of it. But not in a world where the commercial banks and the leverage that they have on behalf of other players, maybe the central banks, in the futures exchanges can, can really control the perception of reality through you know, levered futures contracts where massive short positions like in silver. Why is it that four or five commercial banks hold the largest concentrated short position of any commodity traded on silver? Why? Why would they do that? Uh, and, and the same thing is true of gold. Why do the commercial banks continually short the price of gold? Sure, there's some legitimacy in what they do, but not to that degree. And so, yeah, I think there is a, a, a headwind that the West is um, put into to the price of gold for a very long time, but that plays right into the hands of those trying to accumulate it. And I think there will come a point where the Western system is just rendered obsolete, but not until we reach the point where there's just no gold and silver left to be delivered at those prices. So look, yes, there's a very small portion of it that's legitimate market functioning. People selling because they've been underwater for a long time or or whatever it you know, might be or used to be in terms of thinking of um, normal market dynamics. But I think it's a lot deeper than that. And I think gold and silver, to me, are, are things that they just never have wanted to let go because it really signals that the, the make-believe fiat system is, is breaking, now so more than ever. And But in terms of technical, look, $2,000 appears to be the new support for gold, used to be the high. It held up very well in the face of rising interest rates. Everyone thought it would be horrible for it. It, it, it should be higher. I think it ultimately will be higher. Um, and I think, you know, um, it will be one of these deals where you'll wake up on a Monday morning and it will be way higher because they've just given up trying to hold it down. You know, the, the whole... The whole um, MO of the commercial banks is to short a rising market. Now, who the hell does that? Who shorts a price that's being gobbled up and on so many fundamental reasons why it should be going higher and the world is accumulating it? You get a handful of commercial banks beat the crap out of it. Why? And and who would do that? Normally, it, it, you short a falling market. But if you have unlimited funds and the backing of the uh, of the uh, uh, you know the the West the 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 powers that be. Yeah, you can just keep throwing money at levered futures contracts and 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 just overwhelm the the the, the move upward. And that's what they do. And who shorts a rising market? That's what the commercial banks always do and put a cap on it. Um those days will come to an end because ultimately supply and demand will overwhelm even the ability of of these players to hold down the paper price. And anyone who denies that gold and silver are manipulated, I think is really 
I think they're missing the point. And, you know, yeah, you saw JP Morgan and, and their three traders, including Michael Nowak, their head trader, go to prison, get slapped on the wrist. They should have been charged with RICO. As they were charged, they should have been um, in, um, convicted of that. Instead, they just got spoofing charges. But if you've been following the price of gold and silver long enough, you know markets don't behave this way. Dimitri Speck, I think, is someone that that should be on a lot of people's interviews. Uh, I don't know if he's still working anymore, but there was he's a German. time when I was... Uh, do you know Dimitri, by the way? Uh, I've, I've seen him in Munich before. I haven't interviewed him, but uh, he's German, so... Someone that you should get on, because I used to do interview... I used to do uh, public speaking uh, at the Sprott Show a lot, and I would show a chart that he made, and that chart was one chart of, of 10 years' worth of, of market trading in one chart. And it would show AM fix straight down, PM fix straight down. And, and and markets don't behave that way. They're controlled by the West. And, you know, when the price took off like that, you, everyone was waiting for it to get hammered, myself included. But I will say it this way. You can only suppress a market or manipulate a market over an extended period of time by pushing it in the direction that it is going. And you cannot hold back this kind of demand and and the rest of the world is using this against us and that's the the difference is that they're smart enough to do it slowly enough to where the west hasn't come out and said we're you know we're going to start buying gold ourselves they have they haven't gone after it that hard yet but i think there'll come a time where people realize you know, get all you can right now and when that moment happens the comex and the lbma i think will will lose all global legitimacy and you'll see price setting move to shanghai or to dubai or wherever it may be the countries who have taken the time to methodically accumulate and and take possession of the majority of the world's commodities and i don't think that's as far away as people think uh, last topic I want to talk about is the consumer himself, like the generalist investor. It feels like they're not really at the table. Of course, our audience is well-educated. They know about the role of gold in the, in the overall system here. But it seems like looking at uh, gold-backed uh, ETFs here as well, inflows are not really happening. November, we only got November data to play with right now uh, from the World Gold Council. Uh, North America saw a bit of inflows, but other than that, it was pretty flat, uh, or we have even seen outflows. Right? Why is the generalist investor not at the table yet? Why is not everybody bu buying into gold, looking at what is going on? Like, why? Why? <laughs> well, well, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, when we talk about everyone right now, almost ninety-three percent of all equities are held by the top ten percent of the wealthiest Americans. It's a record high. And if we were talking cryptocurrencies, if someone said there's a cryptocurrency and 93% of it is owned by the the insiders or the very, very wealthy, I mean, people would be waiting for the rug to be pulled, right? And so, I mean, I don't think the majority of America is involved in just about anything right now. They're trying to to put food on the table, the middle class being eviscerated. And, and so you have the very, very wealthy who have become very, very wealthy over the years by enjoying, you know, all of the the benefits of of the last 20 30 years of of being in the system in in real estate in equities in bonds massive three massive bull markets that we've seen courtesy of suppressed interest rates they're traditionalists and so most of the big money in this country which is run by financial advisories that have no interest in in relinquishing any of those funds to gold and silver um that doesn't surprise me at all and you know, the rest of the world sees things differently. And they're the ones that are are accumulating all of the gold and silver. We do see a growing groundswell, if you will, of people understanding this. But I think you will see, you see a bank get bailed in. <laughs> That's the thing. People don't understand that bank bail-ins were written into law in the Dodd-Frank Act. And even though Silicon and Signature were bailed out illegally, and the other banks that have failed were gobbled up by J.P. Morgan or other regional banks. We haven't seen a bank panic yet. And maybe that's when there is another bank failure. And this time it's bailed in where everyone is unsecured general creditors and loses everything. That's when I think you'll see an awakening in this country where people be like, my God, it's not even safe in the bank. Where do we put our money? They just lost everything. Or you look at the, the, the book by David Rogers Webb, The Great Taking. How many people understand 
what's going on with the great taking. How many people understand what that really stands for? The fact that, you know, the change in the universal commercial code where, you know, ownership is, is um, they changed it, the designation to personal property and, and it's a mere contractual claim. And the entitled person is the beneficial owner of the stock, the, the, the custodian. And if, 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 if there are problems, you don't get it. You lose everything. I mean, watch that, read that book or watch that YouTube, The Great Taking by David Rogers Webb, and people would have a whole different opinion on things. It's just that people have no idea what's coming. And I think that's kind of the bottom line. You can't get out of the way of what you don't see coming. The mainstream media does a horrific job. I mean, I ask people all the time, do you know what a, that that gold is a tier one asset? Do you do you know what the Belt Road Initiative is? Do you know what the BRICS are? Do you know what bail-ins are? And I'm talking very well-read people that I associate with here, even in the country club I live in or play golf with, they're all well-read. They just all read the wrong stuff. And the American public is in no position, whether you talk on a broad scale where 65% of the country's paycheck to paycheck, 50% earning over six figures paycheck to paycheck we have you know record indebtedness we have you know uh, uh uh record credit card debt mortgage debt student debt which is our lar largest asset we have you know lowest level of savings and, and so it's like the middle class is being eviscerated the and the majority of all of the investment is in the top 10 percent who has no idea what's coming so i think that's why you see the rest of the world accumulating gold and silver much to the detriment of ultimately the people in this country who will wake up one morning to a new realization. And that's the little by little by little by little and bang all at once. And if you're not paying attention, if you're not seeking alternative media like you and others, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be scooped up like everyone else who has no idea what's about to hit them. Yeah. You may feel it. Something's wrong around you. You look at all the divisiveness and the lawlessness and, and all of these new woke ideologies that are making people feel uneasy. But I don't think people have any idea what is happening, this growing coalition of countries that want so badly to end the Western dominance. And But you can't do that willy-nilly. It has to be done in a manner that will stick when it's thrown against the wall. We're not quite there yet, but when it does, it will catch all of the people in this country by surprise, including the very, very wealthy who have no allocations to gold and silver and we'll very quickly realize that they're the target of this reset. And when everything resets and everyone is brought down to a common denominator, to a lower level, how do you get people to take a new central bank digital currency? Well, you blow up everything that's traditional by letting interest rates go to the moon, have a villain do that, the ones that dump the dollars, it's their fault. Interest rates go to the moon, the whole system implodes and have no fear. Just sign on the dotted line, take the CBDC, we'll make you whole. And, you know, there's something bigger at play here, Kai. That's all I can tell you is that if not, the people running this country really, really, really have led us down a very bad path. And I see it. Problem is, that's all I do is research this stuff. Most people in this country have no idea why they should own gold. One last thing, there's a guy across the street from me. He's on the Forbes top 40 list of uh, financial advisors in, in North America or in the United States. And he manages billions of dollars. The only time he ever mentions gold and silver to me is when they go down. Why isn't it going up? He wouldn't know a gold coin if it fell on his foot, yet he manages billions of dollars. Well, you know, that's the point. Um, that's the point why these people or the West has not taken part in this. Uh, they just don't see any reason to do it. Sadly, they will, but not until it's too late. No, no, absolutely. No, really, really wise words there, Andy. Um, since I have you, last question uh, on, on the bullion side. I need, I need to ask you, you're an expert in that as well. Um, do, you, do you see any trend changes, anything changing in consu consumer behavior on the bullion side right now? You know, one of the greatest mysteries of my career, Kai, will be the fact that over the last three years, premiums have been parabolic across the board, but they're not right now. In fact, availability uh, and premiums are as good as they've been any time in my career. And I, it does not make sense to me because as the father of three p kids, just like you have three kids, I, I'm more concerned as a dad than I've ever been in, in my career, which it will be 34 years next month. I see reasons everywhere I look why people should should be contrarians. As Rick Rule often says, if you're not a contrarian, you'll be, end up being a victim. I believe that. Uh, and yet the the public has... Um, really not 
jumped into the bullion industry. Um, changes? No, not really. Other than the fact that the people that are awake are doubling down. The people that are awake are minimizing their exposure to the banking system and 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 looking at, at gold and silver as, as being a subsidy. But to me, it doesn't really change until people realize there's something coming. And I think that starts with the banks. I think that there will be a bank failure. I think that's what they want. Lael Brainerd, the number two at the Fed, I mean, at the at the White House for economic policy, she was at the Fed. She was at, at the Treasury. She is a modern monetary theorist. She is running point on Fed now and on the new CBDC. You can't do that to 4,500 regional banks. They want the banks to blow up. Well, all you got to do is let one bank be bailed in. And with all of these banks, that, that short-term lending bank program that the Fed has, it's up to $140 billion, and it all has to be paid back in two months. Uh, you see one bank get bailed in, and everyone will be like, oh, my God, did you know that this is law? Do you know that the money in our bank it will be gone, anything over the FDIC limit? Do you know that FDIC has $128 billion in assets backing $18 trillion in deposits? Do you realize that we are unsecured general creditors? And no, nobody does. And when that happens, one bank bailed in and boof, you see a run on the banks like you, you can't believe. You see precious metals and premiums on, on gold and silver go to the moon. When Silicon and Signature Bank failed, we added 14,000 clients in 45 days and they were bailed out. What happens when they're bailed in? And, and no one understands what that means. I bet you a lot of people watching this interview don't know what a bail-in is and, and that it was written into law in, in the Dodd-Frank Act in 2009. And that's why the Republican senator from Oklahoma was so mad at Janet Yellen. You just bailed out these banks. It's illegal. What am I missing? And so the point of it is, is that I think this is kind of the, the really, maybe we'll call it the eye of the hurricane, where we went through the front the front of the hurricane and we saw the craziness that was the, the bank failures in 2023. And, but we're right in that middle right now where it's eerily quiet. I think the trailing edge is coming. And if all it will take will be one bank to be bailed in and, and everything that I just said about gold and silver will be irrelevant because people will say to themselves, well, if it's not safe in the banks and the equity markets are unstable and look at the bond market, what it's done, where do I go? And there are very few places that allow not only value where in a world where everything has been blown sky high because of suppressed interest rates and trillions of dollars thrown into the system where price discovery has become impossible. But but it also is are some of the only assets that are not simultaneously someone else's liability, no counterparty risk. And I think that's going to be a really ugly buzz phrase coming up is counterparty risk as you know, people are, are having a harder time maintaining solvency or making good on their obligations. So keeping your funds in your own personal possession outside the system, to me, is, is something that will, will really be attractive to those people who understand it. Um, so not yet, but I do expect it. Don't know when it happens, but I can see it clearly. It will, it will trigger a rush into this industry that in just a few days, premiums will go to the moon and availability disappears, like we saw most of 2020, 2021, 2022, and the beginning of 2023. Fantastic. Andy, we, we have to leave it at that. Uh, we'll, we'll catch up on your topic at VRIC as well in Vancouver in person. We'll be a media partner there at the conference. Uh, I'll be a keynote speaker myself as well. So we're really looking forward to seeing you in person. Hopefully have a nice cold beverage with you there as well. So. I look forward to it, Kai. You're one of my favorite, man. I appreciate it. I wish you and your family and everyone out there very happy, healthy, healthy uh, 2024. And I uh, look forward to seeing you in a few weeks in Vancouver. Safe travels, buddy. Thank you so much. And uh, same to you, Andy. Thanks so much for your time and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you tremendously enjoyed this conversation here with Andy Schachtman. If you haven't done so, hit that subscribe button down below and leave a comment, leave a like, engage with us. That way, YouTube algorithm helps us share the video, helps us share the message a bit. And uh, we do have a bit of an educational uh, principle here at Soar Financially. Of course, we try to understand the macro or try to understand the macro to understand the micro, meaning what is happening on the mining sides, what's happening with the commodities. And uh, I think we're doing a decent good job at it. We have some great guests joining us later this week as well. So sign up, hit that alert button, and uh, we'll be back with lots more. Thank you so much.